Hello YouTube! Today I'm going to show you yet another of my arcade builds that I've just finished. Even though this build is based on the same blueprint as the previous one, there are a few new features and improvements I want to share with you. Since I've been very happy with the Raspberry Pi 2 and RetroPie, I have decided to continue to use that for this build as well. I have been looking into Retro FE lately as a potential alternative, but for the time being I'm sticking to Emulation Station for its simplicity. The major downside with Emulation Station is that it takes a while to initialize, especially with many ROMs, but once it's running it's perfectly smooth. The biggest new feature are the customized joysticks and buttons. The push buttons are now LED illuminated with a nice chrome edge. They also offer more resistance than the others I've used in the past, similar to the buttons found in the Exacade. Personally I think there's a more premium feel to them, which I really appreciate. Another huge improvement are the customized joysticks. While I don't dislike the joystick itself, the original restrictor plates are almost useless. As you can see, there are three plates that make up the restrictor on the bottom of the joystick. One made out of metal and two plastics. These two green ones are configurable restrictor plates, so you are able to change the joystick into a 2, 4 or standard 8-way joystick by simply moving them. I don't really care about the 2 or 4-way configuration as I normally only use the default 8-way setup, but this is also where the problem lies. As you may be able to tell, the restrictor is round rather than an octagon which makes it almost impossible to differentiate between up, upper left, down or bottom right and so on. In order to improve this, I've decided to remove all three plates and replace the metal plate with my own 3D printed restrictor plate. It's a perfect in-place upgrade which makes a real difference, especially when playing fighting games that requires you to press up right in order to jump forward or such. If you own this kind of joystick, I really recommend this modification. Looking at the side of the arcade, you will still find the speakers with the volume control now move to a higher, more natural position for easier access. The back side of the arcade is pretty much the same as before. It's simple, with only the power input, a power and reset button and a handle. The door is kept in place by magnets, so it's easy to remove without the use of tools. Let's take a look at the inside. The Raspberry Pi is mounted behind the screen with my custom controller board for the LED buttons just next to it. The LED controller board is ridiculously simple. It consists of 16 transistors that makes it possible to control all LEDs individually. A little piece of software figures out what buttons are in use by a given game or platform, how many players it supports and turns the LEDs on or off according to that information. It's also possible to override this from the settings menu, but I will cover that in details in a moment. In previous builds I would normally have power connected directly to the monitor and then supply the Raspberry Pi and speakers from the USB port of the screen. Even though that worked great, I noticed a huge improvement in sound quality when separating the Raspberry Pi from the monitor. Therefore I decided to use a power socket instead for this and future builds so that the Raspberry Pi can have its own power supply. Apart from that, there isn't much interesting going on in here, so let's close it and have a look at the software. When it comes to emulation and games, the build is more or less identical to my previous build, so I won't cover that again in this video. However, I have added a custom menu item that allows the user to configure the LEDs. There are four different settings to choose from. Automatic illumination with on fallback. That means that the script will try to figure out what buttons are in use by the platform or main game. If successful, it will turn on all the specific LEDs and if not, all buttons will blink three times and stay on. Automatic illumination with off fallback. That is the same as before, but the LEDs will turn off if the button configuration cannot be parsed. Configure illumination to be always on or off. The last two options enable you to have all LEDs on or off permanently. Console platforms will only parse the button configuration for the emulator, not the game itself. 
launching a single player game will only turn on the buttons for player 1. If we exit this game and launch a game that supports two players instead, like this one, you will see the buttons for player 1 and 2 light up. Now let's take a look at MAME which is a lot more interesting as the script here will try to figure out which buttons are actually in use by each game. This can be really helpful as the number and type of buttons used vary a lot on arcade games. Launching the game 005, which only requires one button, will only light up the first button. Since the game didn't have any player information assigned, only the button for player 1 is enabled. But this can be easily changed in the user interface of Emulation Station. When launching a game that for some reason doesn't have any button information, all buttons will blink three times and then stay on or turn off depending on your preference, configure in the settings menu earlier. While not all, most games have proper button information thanks to a file called controls.xml. Launching this game from Japan that supports two players also works great, enabling two buttons for each player. That's all for this time. If you appreciate the video, please like it and subscribe to my channel for more videos like this one. If you have any questions or suggestions, feel free to use the comment section below and I will see you next time.